Knowledge about willingness to pay is critical for managerial decision making, but very few know how to model and predict willingness to pay. Together with my research colleague Bernds Guerra from the Goethe University in Frankfurt, we started different data collection approaches in discrete choice experiments. For the most common approaches, we identified three shortcomings with the estimation of willingness to pay, and we developed two new features in discrete choice experiments which results in our new method, separated adaptive dual response. In part one of the three-part video series, I would like to give a brief introduction into the use of discrete choice experiments, with a special focus on choice-based conjoint and dual response. So let's get started with choice-based conjoint. I'm using the term choice-based conjoint if the choice sets contains product alternatives specified by the attributes and the levels, but also the no purchase option. The no purchase option provides a realistic experimental setting and it provides a clear reference point for the respondent. So if the respondent picks, for example, product B, we learn that obviously product B provides sufficient utility to justify a purchase. We also learn that product B provides more utility than product A and product C, which are important information for the estimation of the attributes and the levels. However, if the respondent chooses the no purchase option, we just learn that none of the products provided sufficient utility to justify a purchase. We learn nothing about the attractiveness of the different attributes and the different levels. Now think about a respondent giving answers to, let's say, 14 choice sets, and in seven of these 14 choice sets, he states that he would not make a purchase. So we learn that he has some interest in the product because in the other seven choice sets, he responded to make a purchase. However, we only have these seven choice sets left to make predictions about all the different attributes and all the different levels. To observe more information, researchers proposed the use of dual response, in which a choice set is decomposed into two questions, the first choice question as well as the subsequent free choice question. The first choice question asks the respondent to choose between the different product alternatives without the no purchase option. And the subsequent free choice question asks the respondent to state whether he would buy or not buy the most preferred alternative from the first choice question. It's easy to see that even if the respondent states not to make a purchase, then that we can always obser also observe that the respondent is preferring product B over product A and C. So we have more information allowing us more accurate predictions about these preferences and also about his willingness to pay. No matter whether you're using choice-based conjoint or dual response, to estimate willingness to pay requires that price is always included as an attribute in the choice set. We define willingness to pay as a price at which the respondent is indifferent between buying and not buying the product. To put that into other words, if we offer a product to the respondent at his willingness to pay, his probability of making a purchase is equal to 50%. That's the meaning of the word indifferent here. If we use that definition, we can easily calculate willingness to pay as a ratio between the product preferences beta as well as the product specific attributes described in the vector x divided by the price parameter which is the change in utility of a one euro price change. This type of willingness to pay measurement has been widely applied in practice as well as in research. In part two of this three part video series, I would like to show you why this type of measurement can often fail. And I would also like to show you three shortcomings that are typically associated with the estimation of willingness to pay, no matter whether you're using choice-based conjoint or dual response. 